Good morning, church. Good morning. May the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this morning. So last summer, our family took this amazing road trip across the country. My husband Gary and I planned our family vacation around a concert. Third Day is our favorite band. Amen. And the last stop of their final tour happened to be at Red Rocks National Park in Denver, Colorado. So we went all the way to the top of the Louisville Arch on the way, and we went all the way to the bottom of Carlsbad Caverns. And we rushed through the International Alien Museum in Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> and we got to stand on the corner in Winslow, Arizona. <laughs> and on our way home, we visited Grand Canyon National Park. And we watched the sunset from the rim and we hiked down a little bit into the canyon for a different perspective the next day. And my son Zach and I joked the whole time that we were there that there had to be this elaborate green screen set up somewhere, like in the movies, because the view just didn't seem real. We'd take pictures, and then we'd look down at our phones, and we'd shake our heads in frustration, and we'd try again, and over and over. We did this over and over. Because the canyon is just crazy beautiful. And for me, it was like a bucket list thing. And for my husband, Gary, it was probably his fourth or fifth time that he had gone. And uh, I think he keeps marking it off his bucket list and then putting it back on again. <laughs> because twice he's even spent a week rafting the Colorado River and camping in the gorge. And he once asked me if I would take that trip with him and I said, absolutely, I'll go with you. I am sure there's a Holiday Inn or a Stabridge Suites. <laughs> I will drop you off and I will pick you back up again. Amen. Anyway, God, Gary says that he feels really close to God in the canyon. And the vastness and the beauty that surrounds you there. And in one of my favorite pictures of him, he's actually standing on the rim and he's got his hands spread out like this. And he's just, it's, he's sold out to God in this picture. And he's just looking at the heavens. And I just love, I just love that, that, that picture of just, it's worship um, for me. And he's tried many times to describe the Grand Canyon to us over the years. And I could attempt to do that for any of you who've never been, but I would fail as miserably as he did us. Um, it's just one of those places that you have to see to believe. To, you have to see it in order to be able to understand this beauty that I'm talking about. Because some of the events that we experience in our lives are like that too. Like, before I had children, <coughs> women that I knew would often seem to like pat me on the head when they talked about pregnancy and childbirth. And it was one of those like very patronizing, oh, you'll understand someday, bless your heart. One of those kinds of things. And then a friend of mine and I got pregnant for the first time only a few months apart. And we shared about morning sickness and feeling our babies kick for the first time and hearing their heartbeats and losing our ankles and not being able to tie our shoes. And she promised me that she would tell me all about childbirth because she was due before I was. But she wound up having an emergency C-section, and she welched on me. And after I had my first daughter, Megan, she confessed that she was afraid of scaring me to death. And she never went on to have another baby, but since I did go on to have four more, I can tell you that it wouldn't have mattered what she told me because each child, every, every birth that I had was different. There's a reason that you can't really describe it to anybody, because not only are the experiences unique to the individual, but each situation, each child was different. And then my husband Gary gave a sermon last year where he shared about the smell of freshly baked bread and how it could transport him right back to I-4 in Orlando and the smell of the bread that would waft over from the Merida Bread Factory. Or he actually talked about how right back to Fort Lauderdale where one of his friend's mothers used to make bread all the time that would bring the kids in you know, from outside. And there were several people who understood that. They remember being on I-4 and smelling that. I heard some of you all respond to that. But some of them did not. Some, some folks just didn't know what that, was, what that was all about. Sometimes you have to be somewhere. You have to smell something or see something or hear something in order to make an impression. And I serve as a spiritual director every once in a while for a retreat called the Walk to Emmaus. 
And many of you may have heard about it or gone on it. And if not, you should ask someone about it because it's really good. And basically, it's a short course in Christianity. There's three days that you spend learning about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, and about yourself. And men and women go on separate weekends, and for logistical reasons as well as uh, relational ones, you spend some time in a conference room listening to a series of talks by clergy and laity, and then you spend some time in a chapel, and spending time worshiping and having communion and praying. And there's singing and eating and laughing and eating and discussing and eating and reflecting and eating. <laughs> there is understanding new things and making new friends and growing in grace and learning more about God and the church, which is all of us. And again, like I said, about yourself. And it is the best retreat that I've ever been on. I learned to play guitar just so that I could be an Emmaus musician. And I've served in almost every position on a team. And I've worked at least once, and sometimes twice, and one crazy year, even three times, I wouldn't suggest that, since I first went on this retreat back in 2006. And you, only, you can only attend once, but you can come back and work, and many of us go ahead and do that, because it's such a wonderful experience. We're one, we're giving back, because all teams are made up of folks who've already been, and two, it's just that good. It's a mountaintop experience, and it's a very, in place. The ancient Celts said that heaven and earth were only really three feet apart, but in thin places, they're even closer. Thin places are where the veil is lifted between heaven and earth, and you can get a glimpse of the divine. And thin places are honestly, they're almost impossible to describe, like if you've never smelt that freshly baked bread, or if you've never seen the Grand Canyon. The best we can do when we encounter a thin place is to say, we've been there. We've been to the mountain heaven and earth have come ridiculously close, and the view is amazing, but you just have to see it for yourself. And even then, you still might look around for a green screen. We're in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. And it says, Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James, and he went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And now, Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one of the things that they had seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. So Jesus has been preaching and healing throughout Galilee, and he's chosen 12 apostles from the crowds and all the other disciples who've been following him. And he's given them authority, and he's been teaching them everything that they'll need to know in order to continue his ministry when he leaves them. And right before today's text, Jesus asked his closest friends who the crowds say that he is and what they think. And Peter declares boldly that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus immediately orders them not to tell anyone. And he adds that he's going to suffer greatly, and he's going to be rejected by the religious authorities, and he'll be killed, but he'll raise from the dead three days later. And if that all that wasn't enough, he confides they're all going to have to deny themselves to truly follow him. They'll have crosses of their own to carry, and they'll have to sacrifice their own lives. They have to do that out of their love for God and love for others. But if they're obedient, even as he is obedient, and as he will be, even unto death, they'll get to live with him forever. And then he invites his inner circle of three friends, Peter, John, and James, to go up on the mountain and pray with him. And while he's praying, Deep in conversation with God the Father, his face changes and his clothes become radiant. And now, this also happened to Moses when he went up on a mountain to pray. 
Once when he came back down with the Ten Commandments, everyone knew that he had been in the presence of God because of the way that his face shone. And so just as Peter, John, and James are making this connection, they're realizing, you know, that happened to Moses too. All of a sudden, Moses appears, and he brings with him Elijah. And Elijah was the great prophet that God brought up to heaven. He's the only man who was taken up to heaven without dying. And now, before, when the disciples were asked who the crowds thought Jesus was, one of their answers was even Elijah, because his return was expected to come with or even as the Messiah. And even today, a place is set at the table during Passover celebrations for Elijah. And so here they are together, Moses and Elijah, and they're symbolizing the law and the prophets. Everything that Jesus has said, he has come not to replace, but to fulfill. And the disciples are now not only wide awake, but they're all ears. They want to hear what's going on. They can hear Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah about his upcoming departure in Jerusalem, the one that he just told them about, about his death and about the rejection and the suffering and his resurrection. And even though they can see and they can smell and they can hear and all of their senses are heightened, they just can't wrap their heads around what is happening here. And so Peter, I love him because sometimes I'm just like Peter. I see so much of myself in him. Bold as ever, even in his fear, and maybe especially because of his fear, he calls out to Jesus. Jesus, this is awesome. This is amazing. It's unbelievable. I have no idea what's going on. But I know that God's here. I've never felt like this. And I never want to leave. Let's set up tents for the three of you and for the three of us so that we can just stay here and worship him. And I can see Jesus kind of shaking his head, you know, full of love, but a little bit of frustration, like a parent with a child in a candy store who wants, you know, the child wants to spend all of their money in that one trip into the candy store. And so, and as quick as the fog could roll in on the Sea of Galilee, these guys find themselves in this great cloud on top of this mountain. And it's so thick, they can barely see one another. They, all they can see are these glowing figures of Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And then suddenly this voice booms out of heaven, and it's so loud it almost seems to be inside of their heads. It's like it's coming from inside of their chest. And it says, this is my son, my chosen, my beloved. Listen to him. And no sooner are these words spoken than the clouds disappear. Moses and Elijah are gone. Jesus is back to normal. And they know what they saw, but there's no way to explain it to anyone else. So they just keep it to themselves. And we only know about it now because after Jesus indeed did suffer greatly and was rejected and was killed and then resurrected three days later, Peter, James, and John remembered all of this. And they talked to one another about it. And then they told others about it. And then they told the rest of the world about what had happened on the mountain. And it only made slightly more sense, mostly to those who believed in Jesus, but it was one of those times where you have that sense of deja vu. You're hit with the smell of bread, and you say, oh, I experienced this. I experienced a thin place. I got a glimpse of the divine, and I need to tell you about it. Jesus called 12 disciples, but he only invited three of them up on this mountain. He wasn't playing favorites when he did this. He knew that these three needed to experience this thin place, this mountaintop experience, to better equip them for their calling after his departure. Because sometimes what we experience up on a mountain isn't for us, or it isn't just for us. Sometimes we're given a vision that we need to pass on to others. We're affected personally, but only so much that we're transformed, that we're transformed enough that our own transfiguration causes a ripple effect and we can help others to see what we see. On the night before his assassination, Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech that ended with these words. He says, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up on the mountain. 
and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land, and I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. It's 2,000 years after Peter, John, and James came down from their mountain, we're still talking about the view from the top. We're still talking about the promised land. We're still talking about how to build the kingdom. We're still talking about the glory of the coming of the Lord. Because Peter, John, and James, they saw Jesus with God's glory reflected all around him, reflected from inside of him. And they knew that they knew that they knew that even if they didn't completely understand it, and even if they couldn't fully explain it, they knew that Jesus was the Son of God. God said, this is my son, my chosen, my beloved. Listen to him. Much earlier, in a synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus unrolled a scroll in the temple, and he read from the prophet Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I have come to preach good news and to give freedom to the poor, to the captive, to the oppressed, to the imprisoned, and to the heavily burdened. And he stopped reading, and he rolled his shoulder back up, and he tells them, they just heard him fulfill what he read to them. I have come to preach good news, freedom for the captive, recovery of sight to the blind. And the next line in Isaiah 61, the scripture that he read, talks about proclaiming a day of vengeance. But Jesus leaves that part out. He leaves out that vengeance. He leaves out that part about God's judgment. Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus says, all the law and the prophets, everything from Moses to Elijah, hang on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. And love God, love others as you love yourself. Love others as if you were looking in a mirror and seeing yourself reflected back at yourself. Moses and Elijah are there on the mountain with Jesus. God doesn't say, listen to Moses and Elijah and Jesus. God says, listen to my son. Listen to my son. My son says, love God and love others. Listen to him. My son says, I have come to preach good news to the poor, not judgment, but freedom. Listen to him. My son says, you have heard it say, you've heard it said, but I said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, listen to him. My son says, I desire your mercy more than any of your sacrifices. Go and learn what mercy is. Listen to him. My son says, which one of these is your neighbor? Not the one who was so busy being religious that he couldn't cross the street, but the one who showed mercy. Listen to him. My son says, they will know you are my disciples by your love. Listen to him. Love. Listen. Listen. Love. That's the view from the mountaintop. That's the thin place. That's the promised land. That's the kingdom that we've been building since Peter, John, and James came down from the mountain where they heard God say, this is my son. Listen to him. It is a challenge, but it is a choice. We have always, we always have a choice. God created us, each of us and all of us. God created us in God's own image with free will, fully able to make a choice. And I pray that we would choose to listen and to love. Amen? Amen. Amen.